Good morning everyone. This is the webinar for researching land records before 1856. My name is Emily Hanna and I'll be taking you through this webinar today. So the first thing we're going to look at is some key events and the dates that they took place in terms of pre-1856 land. So Governor Phillip, before he came to New South Wales, was empowered to grant land to emancipists, uh, so those people who were free or became free, um, and didn't issue his first grant till about 1792. There were grants issued after that, um, and the, there was a key change in 1810 when Governor Macquarie came to New South Wales. He cancelled all the land grants that were issued during the Rum Rebellion, only to reissue those that were to those people who were considered to be meritorious persons. Um, they did start to control squatting by the 1820s, and they also scaled back on the issuing of land grants by the mid to late 1820s as well. They developed a system called the Limits of Location, which was basically a line around the early colony and pres prescribing that one could live within and own land within those limits of location, but not without. By 1831, they'd pretty much stopped granting land altogether. In the 1830s, they'd started to realise how difficult what it was to track who had a legal title to a grant of land, so they instituted the Court of Claims to try and start to sort that out. By 1836, they'd appointed commissioners of Crown Lands to start to supervise the area beyond the limit of location, so there's an admission, if you like, that people were going to be illegally living outside the limits of location and they needed to start to supervise and control that land occupation. Depasturing licences came in as a part of that notion um, and then by 1847 they'd replaced annual licences for holding land with 14 year leases. So you kind of get this tightening up of regulation as time goes on. They're stop, stopping giving land away, they're starting to sell that land and things are becoming a little bit more familiar with how we know land today. So some basic things just to get your head across if you're searching land in the New South Wales State Archives. Uh, records of land held and alienated from the Crown are held in the New South Wales State Archives collection. So when we're talking about alienated from the Crown, that's where land is sold or transferred out of the government hands into the hands of private individuals, the ownership of private individuals or private companies, whatever. Um, now, once that land is freehold, which is what we call land once it's been alienated, and that land is transferred, so bought and sold or given to other individuals, so if I sell my land to you, for example, those records are accessed from the New South Wales Land Registry Services. And if you look back in time, it used to be land and property information. Before that, it was the Land Titles Office and before that, the Registrar General's Office. So that's the body that keeps land titling records of land that is freehold. Um, now, a lot of land title records have been digitised and you can see these at home on the Historical Land Records Viewer, which is like a database that the Land Titles Office, Land Property Information, Land Registry Services, as it now is, has made available via their website. So I've put their web address up there for you, lrs.com.au, and then you can follow the links to the Historical Land Records Viewer and search some things. We'll have a bit of a look at that later. It'll be a quick look, but we will look. So as I said earlier, the alienation of Crown land is the process by which the government sold, granted, auctioned Crown land, leading to the granting of freehold title. And the other thing that we think about is the occupation of Crown land. So that's tenure. So in that sense, we're talking about leasing, squatting, if you like, um, or some other sort of licensed occupation. And freehold title in that instance is not granted. So the land is still owned by the government. So land in private hands, land in government hands. So some of the guides that we use quite a bit in the reading room, the first one is the Guide to the Occupation of Crown Land, Crown Land's Guide. It's an oldie but quite a goodie. It goes through 
all of the records that we've got that relate to the occupation of Crown land. So that's all that land that's still government land that people are using in some way for the private use, leasing, licensed occupation, those sorts of things. Um, the thing to remember with the records of occupying Crown land, it's only once they started to actually regulate it that you do find a lot of or a bit more information in the government records. So when it was unregulated and under the, the radar, so to speak, there's very little information available. Um, you can also look at our website at the research A to Z. So there's the land grants guide for 1788 to 1856, which runs through records in the collection to do with land grants and then also the Crown Lands Occupation Guide which provides a bit of an overview of those early records of the occupation of Crown Land. There's a range of indexes that we've got that can help you with your search and of course Collection Search which is our catalogue which lists everything in the collection including now our online indexes and then the other source that's so good is as I said before, the historical land records viewer, where they've started to put those land titles records up online. So this is just our website. Presumably, if you're here listening to this webinar, you have actually um, seen our website before. So you'll recognise that picture of the Harbour Bridge, it used to be a train. Um, and what you'll see here in the picture of the Harbour Bridge is some quick links, and then below that, a big search box. So the quick links are a quick way to find our online indexes, our research A to Z, the links to our webinars. So the online indexes is where people have, often volunteers and sometimes staff, have sat down and listed names of people showing in particular records. So if you think of, of a book of tickets of leave, someone sat there and listed all the names of all the convicts in the tickets of leave and that becomes the index. Um, and there's also a lot of land records listed in the index, so where we've listed names and places to do with land occupation and land records in the collection. The Research A to Z is an alphabetical listing of research topics and all of our land records under L for land. Um, and then the collection search bar underneath the Sydney Harbour Bridge is how you might search what records we hold in the collection. So we'll have a little bit of a look at that later on. So going straight to our research A to Z, clicking on L for land, I come up with a page that looks like this. Over on the left hand side there's a list of all of our different guides to do with land. So you'll see there the land grants guide, you'll see the house and property guide, you'll see the primary applications guide and then you can click on any of those options to bring that particular guide up. We also have a range of useful online indexes when researching land. So of course the Colonial Secretary's papers, um, this is one of our most useful indexes for any kind of research pre-1825 but it's also quite good for land records. It's a name index so if you've got the name of the person you're researching in that time period you can look up their name and then see what correspondence might remain relating to that person in this group of records and then you've got the references to go and view that. Um, after 1825 the records weren't indexed in that particular way but there is an index to the letters received by the colonial secretary relating to land and that covers 1826 to 1856. So if you're researching someone who was involved in land in the New South Wales colony at that time, very useful place to search. Land Grants and Leases, 1792 to 1865, handy if you've got someone who did have a land grant and we'll have a look at those later. There's the index to the Crown Plans and these are the earliest plans and drawings and maps of the New South Wales colony. So the surveyors, they're going out, they're measuring up the land, they're recording their observations, they're drawing rivers, they're drawing coastlines, they're drawing where people's farms were, all of that sort of stuff. That all shows up in the Crown Plans so they're a very useful early source. The Court of Claims Records, another index that's quite nice and we'll look at Court of Claims Records and Depasturing Licences a bit later in the talk. The Squatters and Graziers Index we'll also look at as well. 
Now, I'm not talking a great deal about the surveyor's field books today, just suffice it to say that we do hold the field books from 1794 to 1860. And the field books are diaries of the surveying expeditions, descriptions of natural features, sketches of farms, town allotments and roads. They also had a lot of trigonometrical, trigonometrical sorry, observations and triangulation surveys in those books. So if you speak surveyor, they're quite useful, but sometimes they'll also be useful to the everyday person as well. And sometimes you'll even find a lovely sketch that they might have driven, drawn by the fireside at night time. Um, and then the sketchbooks, which we also are not spending much time on today. The sketchbooks were basically drawings of land features or houses, oh, sorry, um, villages and towns and extensions, um, allotments, there's sketches of land, the ownership of which might have been in dispute, encroachment on crown lands and the tracings of reserved roads through allotments and street alignments in towns. There's tracings of land reserved for churches, schools, cemetery and other public pur purposes. So when the surveys were out and they would send reports of what they were doing back to the Surveyor General. They'd often include sketches of where they were and what they were doing as well. Um, and these were glued into what we call the sketchbooks. And these have been, uh, not all, but a lot of these have been digitised and you can view them through collection search. So they're a really nice, really nice little series to know about. And the last one that we're not really talking about today, but does exist, is the Index to Surveyor's Letters. And they're letters sent by the surveyor from when he's out in the field back to the surveyor general reporting on what he's doing, um, sending back his descriptions of the land that he's measuring up. He might send reports back about the people on his expedition, so the convicts and the support people, the horses, the tents, the equipment, all of that stuff. They might send detail of where they've been that particular day and how far they travelled and what they got done. So they're quite a useful source. They're indexed by the name of the surveyor and also by the places that they went to. So if you're doing local history, very useful. So the online index pages look like this. Um, when you're searching an online index, you can see on the left hand side there's a, a column listing the titles of the indexes. If you click on each of those titles, you'll get some detail about what the index is, what it covers, what kinds of information is in the records. So it gives you a bit of a context about the index. And then of course, if you click on the search the index box, you get to search the index. Now we're just going to talk about the limits of location because this will come up again and again during the talk today. Um, so the limits of location was set up in 1825 and the idea was that settlers were only permitted to take up land within this area. Um, and there's a little mud map there on the right hand side of the screen kind of showing you where those limits of locations were. Um, in 1829, they expanded that to be the, the, the boundary was at the 19 counties. So that picture there is actually of those 19 counties. And that was designed to curb the outward expansion of the settlement, um, but didn't work very well. <laughs> so it was, um, but it's still a useful notion when you're researching government land records. So the idea was that within or inside the limits of location, you could own freehold land, um, smaller tracts of land were settled in comparison. Um, the land was alienated mainly by grant and then later auction. Um, and the alienation was generally more orderly than the occupation of Crown land. So outside the limits of location, it was always people occupying Crown land. They would go for bigger portions, bigger tracts of land, so thousands of acres rather than hundreds. Um, the land would be held after they started to regulate it, mainly by lease or by licence. So that's where the occupant has the use of the land. He pays for it, of course, but doesn't own it. And then the thing to note too is that there's a lot fewer records about the occupation of Crown land, particularly the occupation of Crown land outside the limits of location. So that can often be a bit of a stumbling block in your research.
So land grants from 1787, all land vested in the Crown was Crown land um, and Governor Philip was empowered to grant land to emancipists, but he only ended up granting about 4,000 acres. Um, male convicts, once they became three free, were entitled to 30 acres, another 20 if they got married, and then 10 acres for every child they had with them at the time that the grant was made. Women were also entitled to receive grants of land. And then from 1789, Governor Philip was instructed to grant land to free settlers as well. So the Marines were entitled to 100 acres and the privates to 50 acres above that allowed for the convicts. From 1792, land, larger land grants were issued um, and these often became the subject of land speculation and exploitation. Uh, by 1810, Governor Macquarie start, does cancel land grants issued during the Rum Rebellion, but he does reissue those who are who he could, to to people whom he considered to be deserving and meritorious. Um, they started to curb back the granting of land in 1825, so they introduced the sale of land, Crown land, by private tender. Um, but they could still, the government would still grant land for areas between 320 and 2,560 acres, unless it was near a town or village, in which case the grants would be smaller. So they started to survey the whole colony at this stage, and that's when they started to divide the settled districts into parishes and counties. So that doesn't happen till about 1825. And then from 1831, there's no more land grants unless the government had already promised a particular land grant to someone. All land is sold by public auction and you'll find information about this land sales proclaimed in the government gazettes three months in advance of that sale. So when you're searching for land grants in the New South Wales State Archives collection, I'd be looking for things like memorials. So that's where an individual has written to the governor or to the colonial secretary to apply for a grant of land. And they'll often provide some biographical detail of why they want the land, how good they'll be at looking after that land, why they deserve to have it, the reason for asking for so much and how they can support to be working on that land. So they're, they're quite useful for a lot of reasons, not only the land reasons, but also for family history and other types of research. So you'll find those in the Colonial Secretary's papers before 1825, and then from 1826 to 56 in the letters received relating to land. You'll also see that we've got indexes and registers of land grants, 1792 to 1865 indexed on the website, as are the two things above it. Um, you can look at maps and plans because the original grantees will always show up on a parish map, even 200 years later, 220 years later, the original grantee is still shown on a parish map to this very day. Trove is really good, uh, so the Government Gazettes now are digitised for New South Wales and available for searching on Trove, and they're quite useful for searching any kind of land transaction, any kind of tenure from the government, any kind of sale from the government, look at government gazettes and newspapers as well, another useful source. And of course, the HLRV, the Land Registry Services database. Never forget that one. Now this is just an example of a list of land grants and leases registered in the Colonial Secretary's office. This one here is dated 1794 and the entry that we're looking at there is down the bottom for Thomas Davini who got 100 acres in the district of Toongabbie. Um, so that's all it tells you, it's just a record that he got the land, it doesn't tell you details of where it is or anything like that but there are other sources where you can find out further information. Um, this is a page from the index to the Colonial Secretary's papers before 1825. As I said before, it's a name index and where possible they listed all the letters that they found for an individual under that individual's name and then they'll give you some identifying details up the top. So um, 
Lieutenant Robert Lethbridge. He was the master of the Grace in 1821 and then came back on the Lusitania in 1823 and settled around Prospect. And the very first thing you see there is a memorial for him applying for a grant of land at Ropes Creek. So when we go to the next screen, what we see is the memorial of his application for that land at Ropes Creek. So um, he got £3,000, uh, he wants to become a settler and he's also purchased a house um, near at Point Piper so that's proof that he's actually willing to stay in the colony um, and he'd like to have the land near his relative Captain King please. Now this is another application or letter to the governor um, saying where he'd like to have the ground. Um, so bounded by Rope Creek and Major Jort's farm. Um, so that'd be very nice. Thank you, please, governor. And then on the second page on that right hand side, you can see there's some writing upside down. So that's an annotation to the letter. And what we say to you is always read the annotations because they can often tell you what the outcome of an application or a memorial was. So in this particular instance, the colonial secretary was to say, no, you're not getting that land, thank you very much, because that's right next to a government establishment um, and you can't have your grant without destruction to our settlement, so no. But I think Robert Lethbridge was all right and went on to get land elsewhere, so he was fine. Um, now, this index page here that you're looking at now is the index to the Colonial Secretary's letters relating to land, 1826 to 56. Those of you who've used our website in the past but may not have recently will notice that the pages have changed. Um, that is because we've reissued collection search with new software and so we've made some changes. Um, you can still search the indexes individually, so this is where I've actually gone in to sec search the Colonial Secretary's letters relating to land. I've put in the name Lethbridge and I've come up with where that every entry that shows Lethbridge in the entry there. Down in the bottom of the screen you see that I've got options to copy that, I can send it to Excel, I can PDF it or I can print that list, that's all very nice. And then I've also got some details, there's a list on the right hand side of the screen there which says details and I can click on that red word saying details and it will take me to the database or the catalogue, sorry, collection search. So this is just to show you what something looks like if you export it into Excel. And then once I put it in Excel, then I can search and manipulate that data and sort it however I like to. When I clicked on the red details button, this is what you come to, it sends you to our catalogue. And once you're in the catalogue, if the index is available for copying, you can order copies of those records. The Colonial Secretary's letters relating to land, we don't offer a copy service for simply because there might be one or two letters for a person or there could be one or two hundred letters. So it was just very variable. Um, so this is one that you still need to come into the reading room for. But what it tells us is that we do hold letters relating to Robert Lethbridge, this particular group of letters starts in 1828 and goes up to 1824 and there's some remarks there which say that there's papers Rayland previously owned by William Kelman Dalrymple, William Dalrymple Kelman sorry, and it gives us the real number to then go and look at those letters um, and away you go. So I just diverted for a very small second into collection search generally. So this is the catalogue where you saw the search bar under the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Put the name Robert Lethbridge there and it will come up with every single record we've got that's got Robert Lethbridge in the title. So I'm not saying that the top Robert Lethbridge is our captain who arrived in 1821. He, this is a jail inmate who was in jail after 1870 so I'd say quite likely not our Robert Lethbridge and then there's other records underneath that that you can look at. You can filter your results to just look at information from a particular index or from a particular series or only those that are digitally available. 
Um, you can also, if you log in, you can pin your favourite records for later thinking about and you can tag records as well so you can make little comments about things but you can only do that if you've logged in. Now Robert Lethbridge letters received from individuals by the Colonial Secretary 1826 to 56. So here we go, we've got a letter sent after 1826 to by Robert Lethbridge to the Colonial Secretary. This one's actually in 1826. So he's asking for an extension to his present grant of land. Um, and the reason for that is that he saved some dispatches committed by the Governor Macquarie to his charge at great personal risk when he returned from New South Wales in command of the ship The Grace, which was destroyed by fire off the coast of Africa. So it, as a, a payment for that service, he's asking for some more land. Um, the other kinds of documents that you might find in the Colonial Secretary's letters received relating to land, and these letters will be anything to do with land in the colony. So the grant, lease, purchase, anything to do with land. So this is another application for permission to purchase land. So this is 1837. Land grants have pretty much stopped by this stage. So you had to buy land, but he's asking for permission to buy these particular portions of land all over the place. So County of Durham, the second one um, at Falbrook, County of Durham, third one in the County of Durham and the fourth one in, uh, I can't read that. Anyway, um, so he's got four portions of land and by the end of it, he's going to own a significant part of the County of Durham. Um, now this is the Colonial Treasurer's report about lands authorised to be purchased uh, during the administration of Sir Thomas Brisbane and Sir Ralph Darling. So talking about Robert Lethbridge land at Fourbrook in the county of Durham, um, how big the land was and how much he paid for it. So it's still within that correspondence of the Colonial Secretary. The next thing we're going to look at is the index and registers of land grants and leases. So there's an online index that goes up to 1865. Registers of land grants and leases are on microfilm. So this is the copy kept by the Surveyor General of, of land grants and leases. So the information kept by the Surveyor General about those land grants and leases. And then you can also look at the land grants guide in the research A to Z for additional indexes, registers and other records to do with those land grants. Um, so going to collection search, Robert Lesbridge, index to land grants and leases. We can see here one example of one of his land grants. Um, he obtained 2,000 acres at Prospect. And then the next page is actually that Surveyor General Register of Land Grants and Leases. So we saw a list that was collect, kept by the Colonial Secretary earlier. Now we're looking at a register of land grants and leases. So this tells us more information. It tells us the name of the grantee. It tells us how many acres, whether it was a grant or a, a lease. It tells us where that land was, who granted that land. Um, it tells us if there were any witnesses. It tells us a description of where the land was and there's remarks over on the right hand side there. So he had to actually maintain convicts um, and there were conditions attached to this particular land grant as well. Now the other interesting thing to just know about at this point is that you'll also get the Registrar General's copy of the land grant if you check the HLRV, the Historical Land Records Viewer. So this is something you can do at home through the Land Registry Services website. So they have indexes, the old system grant index is the one that you're looking for here. And I'm not going to go into how to do it because that would take a bit of time, which we don't have for this session, but there are fact sheets on the Land Registry Services website that tell you how to search for different
different kinds of records. So there is information about how to search the old system grant index there. So for this particular exercise, I've gone to L for Lethbridge and I've gone through that index. I found Robert Lethbridge prospect 2000 acres and then on the right hand side of the page I get the serial and page number and I need to write that down because that's going to get me to the grant register so 18-30 and then when I search the HLRV search for the old system grant register 18-30 serial and page 18-30 I come up with the actual land grant so this is the registrar general's copy of it and we can see that was granted on the 30th of June 1823. Um, just a little side note as well you'll see there's the blue writing on the left hand side which says application 8678 and there's a range of other numbers underneath what that's to do with is when the land that originally was granted to Lethbridge was transferred from old system over to Torrens title. So each of every time someone applied to the government to do that, it was called a primary application and it was given a number. So the first application number is that 8678 and that would have been for a bit of that 2000 acres and then all those numbers after that would have been for other bits of that 2,000 acres to be transferred from old system over to Torrens title as that land was broken up and became more of the suburbia that we're familiar with today. So you can also look in the government gazettes for details of land grants. So on our right hand side here we've got in the county of Durham in 1838 we've got oh, Robert Lesbridge getting 640 acres at Falbrook in the county of Durham. So there it is. Um, just remember that government gazettes didn't actually start till 1832. So you won't see this kind of thing before 1832. But before 1832, I would look in the newspapers of the day. And this is just another page from the government gazette. This is looking at title deeds, for town allotments and other land and we can see Robert Lethbridge the second of the bottom um, getting 1200 acres in the county of Durham at Falbrook and this was a land grant that's promised in 1828 but not actually delivered until 1837. Maps and plans are also really useful when searching early land in New South Wales. So the best source is the Surveyor General's Maps and Plans. These are indexed on our website. Um, the, the way they're listed is quite interesting because it's very ad hoc as the record or the plans and maps were created in the day. Um, so you can search it by surveyor's name, you can search the index by a place name, and the other thing to remember is to search it by the words that would have been used to call that place and the spelling that would have been used back in that time period. So spellings change over time, place names change over time. Go back to original spellings and original place names as much as you can. Um, many of the maps and plans, these early crown plans, have been digitised by land registry services. Um, we have special access in our reading room to allow people to view crown plans but that's not available anywhere else. So you can't view crown plans at home, you can't view crown plans in the State Library but you can view them here in our reading room. You still have to order copies from land registry services but you can at least see them before you go to order them. And parish maps is the other thing. So parish maps which sort of start to appear in the 1830s, 40s, they're also available for searching on the HLRV. You can search these from home, it's only the Crown Plans you can't, but you can search parish maps, yes. Um, and they'll show the name of the original grantee or the Crown Land tenure holder. There's 141 counties and 7,459 parishes. So parish names do tend to be reused in different counties. So you do need to be aware of which county your parish is in because otherwise you won't get the right map. Um, they did do parish maps for eastern and central divisions of New South Wales but they didn't do them for the western division. So what you'll usually see in the western division is county maps and parishes will be delineated on there. 
um, and private towns that were subdivided out of privately owned land. You won't see maps for those either. Now this is just what the index to the Surveyor General's Crown Plans looks like. So this is a Harper map that we're looking at here. Uh, you see the survey, the map's just called Survey of Farms with Names and it's the parishes of Melville and Rudy Hill, no date. What you get on there is the Surveyor General's map. So every map was given a number in the Surveyor General's office. Um, and it, the M would be to do with that district. So M for Melville, M for, that's the numbering that they've used for there. So you get lots of useful areas like R for roads and I for interior. Um, and then on the next thing over is our map number. So that's the number we use in our collection. This is what they, the early plans, crown plans can look like. So if you're doing early, early research, they're quite useful. So this is this Harper map of Melville and Rooty Hills. So we can see up there, we've got a, a grant to James Whalen for 300 acres. And then we've got um, George Druitt's Mount Druitt grant underneath. And this next page, there we go, um, shows you an, a larger section of that particular plan. So again, we've got the RPA, the primary application numbers there. We've got the dates that the land grant was issued. We've got where it is in relation to the next person down. So George Stewart and James Whalen next door to each other there. And we also know that there's a box tree on George Stewart's land. So that's very nice. Um, and then some of those early roads as well. So this would be very early Mount Druitt. Now I've been talking a little bit about the HLRV. So the kinds of things that land registry services have digitised and put up there are things like charting maps, historical parish maps, the crown plans, which we said before you can only see in our reading room, the early grant, grant index and the register, that's old system grant index, the vendors index, the purchases index, the old system deeds, the Torrens purchases index and the old form Torrens register. So I'm not going to look at the Torrens register today because that's outside our time period. Um, just to note that a lot of people did apply to change their land from old system to Torrens title and that's what the primary application packets are. So this is just what the website for the historical land records viewer looks like. You can select what you want to search. So in this instance here I've selected just to search historical parish maps for the parish name of Prospect. So I've put Prospect in and the first thing you notice is there's County Cumberland and County Macquarie. Today I'm looking at County Cumberland Prospect because of the whole Robert Lethbridge, Mount Druitt, everything that we've been talking about today. Um, and then this is a copy of the map, that first, very first map there that um, I found when I did that search. So you can see the whole map there and because they've put quite high resolution images up, you can actually blow that up to see the detail quite closely. I could have blown it up some more to see some of that other tiny writing, but I thought this would be enough for today. So here, this is a later map. This is 1894, but you can see that Captain Robert Lethbridge with his 2000 acres, that land grant is still there next to John Campbell at Bungarabi there with his 2,000 acres and then above that and to the left of Robert Lethbridge is Robert Crawford with his 1,000 acres. And another cute map, this is an earlier map um, with no date unfortunately but you can see it's a little bit earlier but it's still that parish of prospect and you can see those other three land grants Robert Lethbridge and the other two that we were just talking about before. So you get a sense of how the land's starting to be broken up for further settlement. And you can see all those on the HLRV, so it's very nice. Another record that's quite useful is what we call the Old Register, which is a record that was kept by the Judge Advocates Office and it was a place where people could register assignments and other legal instruments, so agreements really. Um, they didn't start it till 1802, but people were allowed to register 
assignments and other legal instruments back to 1794. So the registers will show the number, the names of the parties and the nature of the agreement. So it's quite useful for land transactions but other things as well between people. So those records have been digitised and they were indexed and the index and the digital copies are available on a DVD. We have a copy of it in our reading room but you'll also find that some public libraries and historical societies, family history societies may also have a copy of it as well. The index looks like this and remember this is on the DVD so it's an alphabetical index. There's the agreement from index and the agreement to index and so for each entry it'll tell you the from person, the to person, the details of the agreement and then it will give you also the reference to then go and find the record and then the date of the record there. So we're looking at that second agreement between John Palmer and William Lawson to do with Harris Farm and Smith's Farm at Pro in Prospect District and it's an indenture. And this is the actual agreement itself. So I've just copied this straight off the DVD. I will talk quickly about primary applications. So just to note that you will find detail in later records about early land holdings. So in 1863 there was what they called the Real Property Act and that introduced Torrens Title um, and Torrens Title is what we use today for the land title system. So the primary application was the procedure to convert old systems, so pre-1863 land holdings to Torrens Title and it was done, the application was made by the holder of the land at the time. So people were still doing these up to, well, very recent times. So from 1863 onwards. So they're listed by the name of the person who made the application. And what that person had to do was show the chain of ownership from the date of the land grant all the way up to when they held that land, which is why they're useful for early land research. So in the collection we've got the forms that they had to fill in to make the application as well as the documents that they also had to submit with that application to show the chain of ownership. And you see all sorts of wild and wonderful things in those applications. So you might see wills or mortgages. Very occasionally there might be something amazing like a ticket of leave. but could I find one for this talk? No. Um, and I think I've even seen an original land grant with the original seal on it that would have been kept by the person receiving the grant. So you can get all kinds of things in there. You can find the RPA number from a parish map. You can find it off the certificate of title. You can find it in the Government Gazette. You can find it in Collection Search. Um, so if you knew the volume and folio of the particular land that you're researching and that was the first one that was issued as a result of the primary application, you can actually search by that number to then get the, the primary application number. So this is just a couple of places where you can see for yourself where you can see those application numbers. So on the left we've got that application number in the blue writing and then on the right we've got the, the red writing where it says RPA 39781 and then RPA 41160. Now if I did a search for that James Whalen land, that 39781, I would come up with both the primary application form and then also the primary application packet. So we've got both of those in our collection. So for this talk I've just pulled out the form and I've copied that so you can see it and it tells you it's Ambrose Cleve Taylor who's making application to have land in the area of Blacktown, parish of Rudy Hill converted from old system to Torrens title. So he's got to describe where the land was, he's got to say who the neighbours are and then on the right hand side down the bottom he's got to give a list of what the chain of ownership was. So right back to James Whalen getting that land grant in 1831 and how it's gone through to various people since that day. So they're quite useful if you're doing pre-1856 land. 
Now, chain of ownership is always an issue, um, particularly before 1856 and particularly as they were discovering by the 1830s, it was becoming a little bit of a mess. So by 1831, it was noticed that many people had been promised grants of land, but weren't in possession of the titles to that land because the title hadn't been issued and wouldn't be issued until the grant had been surveyed. So there was a bit of a backlog. Um, but there were also issues where land was in the possession of people who claimed to have the right through original promises or and other people would dispute that claim. So it was becoming impossible to produce legal titles that were recognised by the Supreme Court. So there was an act in 1833, they appointed three commissioners for two years to hear these kinds of claims at what they called the Court of Claims. And the process continued under 1835 legislation. So two years wasn't enough, they needed to keep it going for longer. When you're looking for Court of Claims records, um, the, think about the sorts of things that they had to do to get a claim in motion. So they had to do a memorial, which was given to the commissioners of claims. The commissioners registered memorials, so they kept a list of what the memorials were. And then they later on kept a register of the cases. So the early memorials are indexed on our website. Um, and then we've also got copies of the memorials that were sent from the Commissioners of Claims back to the Colonial Secretary. Um, and then for the later Act, that 1835 Act, the registers of cases are indexed in the front of each volume and we've got the reports going from the Commissioner of Claims back to the Colonial Secretary. We've also got a guide on our website to talk about further records. So this is the index here. We're looking at Joseph Bolsover, who was a farmer at South Creek. So he's put up a memorial for a claim. Um, and this is his memorial here. So he, he's, he's talking about the land and then he's talking about the circumstances of that land. So this particular land that's under dispute was land that was promised to Bernard Williams by Governor Macquarie. Now William died, Williams, sorry, died intestate. Um, the children were all under age, so that's what infants means, and the land was left to his widow. Um, but to pay the debts of the estate, she actually had to assign the land over to Bolsover. And this is the memorial by the Commissioner of Claims forwarded back to the Colonial Secretary. Um, as part of the report there, they've got details of all the children's births, their dates of birth and their dates of christening. Um, it's got to do with the circumstances of the land. It's got to do with Bernard dying and then the land being made over to Joseph. Um, and right at the very end, um, it says that Anne kept a public house soon after her husband's death and gave herself up to drinking, so much so that the said Joseph Bolsover, who was a shipmate with the deceased on his passage to New South Wales, advised her to give up the public house. So I think life just hadn't treated Anne very well, unfortunately, and the result of that was that she lost this land to Joseph Bolsover to keep everyone afloat. Now, just thinking about the occupation of Crown land. Um, so we talked at the beginning to say occupation, so the land's still owned by the government. People are living on government land, either legally by lease or license or whatever, or they're living there illegally or in an unauthorised manner, I suppose you could say. So unauthorised occupation of Crown land was there from the earliest days of the colony and various regulations were set up over time to deal with what they called squatting. So we saw before that the limits of location were set up in 1826 and then that area was increased in 1829 to what we call the 19 counties. Um, by 1833, there was still extensive unauthorised occupation of Crown lands, um, but this seems to have had so they passed the Encroachment Act to deal with that, but it doesn't seem to have worked very well. And they were finding it was impossible to prevent the squatters expanding themselves. 
So rather than beat them, they tried to join them in a way, I suppose, and legalise and regulate squatting through further legislation in 1836. Um, these regulations included things like issuing licences to settlers to depasture their stock on vacant Crown lands on application to the Colonial Secretary. And then 1836 also provided for the appointment of full-time commissioners of Crown lands beyond the limits of location. So the commissioners kind of were the government representative outside the limits of location. So they'd be the magistrates, they'd be inspecting for land, they'd look after the, the police, what policing there was out there. They'd possibly also be in charge of whatever court there might be out there. Um, and as part of their job, they had to inspect stations in their land district and send reports back to the government. So some of those key dates, they really start in 1824 with the tickets of occupation, um, going right through that trying to stop people living outside the limits of location and then starting to regulate that area, that issue. Um, and then everything changed in six, 1861 with the Robertson Land Act. So they had the Robertson Alienation Act of Crown Land and then the Crown Land Occupation Act. So all land from 1861 was open for occupation, including that that was already on pastoral lease. So that changed a lot. Here we see the squatting districts in 1847. So you can see they're a lot further out than the 19 counties there, which is really just that small area around Sydney. Um, and that's a list of what the squattage districts were at that time. So from the earliest times, we hold records to do with tickets of occupation, 1826. There's applications for land to be held on grazing leases. So it's very, the records are very intermittent and they don't tend to tell you a lot. So they're, they're quite elusive sometimes. People started to apply to rent Crown lands within the boundaries in 1831. Um, and then also doing that by 1841 as well. What we see here is an application by John Dite, who was permitted temporary occupation of land near Bungbung for use as a grazing run. So this is 1823, and this was just found in the Colonial Secretary's Index um, by looking under D for Dite. When you're looking outside the settled districts, we have to think of things like depasturing licences, which didn't start till 1837. So we've got the Treasury keeping the certificates for those licences and also annual returns of depasturing licences. And then also the itineraries and returns that the Commissioners of Crown Lands sent back when they were out looking at various stations and those sorts of things. The itineraries and returns are indexed in the index to squatters and graziers on our website. So this is an application from Thomas Pye. He's applying for a departuring license in 1836. It's talking about himself. So he's free, he's married, he's got three children. He wants to departure his said stock um, under the charge of Edward Sheen, who's free and overseer to be stationed on the banks of the Wogan Creek in the, near the Lachlan River. So quite a bit of detail about what he's wanting to do and why he's wanting to do it. And also how much land and cattle and horses that he had at that time and a lovely signature, a lovely signature there. So depasturing is really just that act of letting your stock graze on land. So they would let you do that for a fee and that's the first real attempt to control squatting beyond the limits of location. Um, this letter Oh, sorry, the next letter that we're going to see is actually also listed in the Joan Rees Index to Colonial Secretary's Correspondence. That's an index that's now available on CD, so you can search that by the name of the person, you can search it by remarks, so I could put depasture in and come up with a range of letters about that. I could put the name of a ship in or I could put the word asylum and come up with various hits on that. It also gives me the letter number and also the box number for that letter. Uh, the next page is his application, which we found in that previous index. Um, and by now he's got four children. He's got 
a ticket of leave man who is going to supervise it and he's increased his cattle and his horses. This one's in 1839, so he's doing okay. Um, and then we've got the depasturing license itself. So we've got, I've just searched the index, found Thomas Pyre, found that 1839 reference there. And then here we see the certificate for the depasturing license. I have to say, looking at it in the context of the applications is quite useful. Um, you do get a lot less information on the certificate itself. And the last thing you'll be pleased to know we're looking at today is the Squatters and Graziers Index, that's 1837 to 49. So this is where the Commissioners of Claims went around their district and they had to inspect and report on the various stations that were in their areas. So they thought of a squatter who would be someone who settled on Crown land to run stock, especially sheep. Um, initially without government permission, but later with the lease or the licence. And the grazier is someone who owns a rural property on which sheep or cattle are grazed. So that's an interesting little difference there of the definitions. So again, we've got those records indexed and it's that same type of index here. You can search by the name of anybody. You could also search by the name of the station, the superintendent, whichever you felt was the most useful for your research. And then here we've got the return itself. So what you see here is the station named, the person who's licensed to hold that station, the name of the person who superintends that station, the estimated size of the run. So these are large stations, some of them. The one that we've picked there, Hopkins Hill, is 40,000 acres. Um, it tells you how it's watered, so which creek or dam or whatever it might be. It tells you the number of people living on the station. So we've got 35, I think it's 25, sorry, 25 people, mostly men, living on that particular station. And then it tells you how much livestock is there, the horses, the cattle, the sheep. So it's just giving you a kind of a picture of what's happening outside of that limits of location and what people were doing there. And there were quite a significant number of people by that time. So that's the end of the presentation now. Um, I would like to thank you all for attending.